Welcome to Faking It, a podcast that explores stellar life experiences and is based on the notion that we're all getting through life experience by experience, faking it till we make it. I'm your host, Liz Hodson. Welcome to episode six of Faking It. Thanks for joining us again, everyone. In this episode, I interview Chopped Canada champion and personal chef, Paul Lillikis. We talk confidence, what comes after winning a reality cooking show, responding to a mysterious Craigslist ad that would change his life forever, and so much more. Here we go. So let's just start off. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm, I'm a chef. I'm sort of a mix of self-taught and industry trained. Um, I've been working in food for about almost 12 years now, since I had my first job at Pizza Hut when I was 15. Was that where it all began? Yep. <laughs> I love telling people that because they're always like, oh, Pizza Hut. But it's such I mean, a beautiful beginning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was fun for a 15-year-old. I mean, yeah, why not? I had no bills. I liked to cook. I liked to eat pizza. I liked to smoke cigarettes, and they let me do it, even though I was a 15-year-old. <laughs> and they would buy them for me. Oh, not ever, not Pizza Hut the company. <laughs> I mean, Ooh, um, <laughs> edit, edit, note to self, edit. <laughs> no, but my managers were really cool, and I enjoyed it, and you know, I gained a lot of weight. But from from being like kind of first job, getting really into it, and just being like pizza galore. No, yeah, free pizza. That's it. That's it. <laughs> got Often pizza, leads cheese, to weight bread. gain. <laughs> yeah. it's really our whole menu is different forms of bread with cheese toppings. On it. Yeah, yeah, cheese, or namely cheese jellies and frosting on their <laughs> dessert pizza but i digress <laughs> so yeah I, it all kind of started there and then i followed many sort of different winding roads uh and they all had me working evenings and weekends in the food industry pretty much and so my love for food kind of developed parallel to all these other passions of mine um from high school onward Right on. So that's, uh, I guess when somebody asks you a lot about yourself, that's a huge part. Do you think like right away when someone's like, so how's it going, Paul? Who are you? You think I'm a chef? Like, is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah. And you've done other things. You, yeah. You've been a comedian. You are a comedian. I consider you a comedian, but you've done stand up. You you are formally trained in that. You're an actor. So it is chef right away. Yeah. Well, and definitely people know me as a chef now. And whenever somebody introduces me now, they say, this is my friend Paul the Chef. Nobody <laughs> nobody calls me an actor or a comedian. Paul the Chef. Yeah. Sounds uh, like you're a character in like a Quentin Tarantino film. And yeah, you're gonna... Well, <laughs> I feel typecast in my own life. <laughs> Pretty much. So then how did the, the whole acting thing was, was that, oh wait, so but like for cooking, like was that, when did you, before you were 15, I'm surely you had other influences and different things like that in your life that... In, influenced you to be a chef? Want to well, talk about that a little bit? Sure. I, I, well, I always enjoyed cooking. I was really young when I told my mom that I wanted to be a chef. Um, I think we were on the way to the cottage, and I just having you know snuggled up to my mom and my grandma while they were cooking, who they basically raised me, um, and watching them cook, I just knew that I was really interested in that, and I, I ended up learning very quickly and reproducing recipes alone at a very young age and then at one point I told my mom I think I want I think I said something like I want to move to Europe and be a chef or I want to move to Europe and yeah learn how to be a chef and so I may, might have been maybe 12 or 13 or something <clears throat> a career planning and so, <laughs> typical Paul <laughs> but yeah and and so I just found a love for it very early on and it obviously very much tied to my love of eating mm-hmm. <laughs> And I knew that I could make friends really easily when I was a kid. You you kind of noticed uh, that that food brought people together. And was that something culturally that you learned? Or was it just like sort of an innate thing? You come from a, a specific background, Estonian, right? Yep. So I'm Estonian. So like any European, like most cultures, I, I mean, yeah, yeah food, food ties everyone together. And you overeat when you're in large groups. And that's always when you have the most fun is when the best and most food is around, seemingly, it's consumed, right? consumed, yeah, of course. Right. So, so you notice that you could make people come together that way. Yeah, yeah, I could make people come together, and I noticed that I could make people come to my house. So when I was a kid, I always liked 
having people over to my house rather than having to travel to their place because it, I guess it was easy when mm-hmm. you were done hanging out. Everyone just goes home and you're still home. Yeah. Uh, plus, I, I did love to cook for my friends. And what I would do when I was a little kid, and by little kid, I mean like from the age of maybe <clears throat> 11 onward or something like that, mm-hmm. I would always have friends over and then I would sort of put them in another room or we'd be playing in 64 or something like that back in those days and <laughs> and then i just kind of get inspired or they would sometimes they would say you know i'm hungry and then i would get inspired or just randomly i would say wait here and i'd go into the kitchen and then i would start making something like in those days it was you know i don't know grilled cheeses or things like that but i would make them fancier than their parents did i'd add spices or, or, or <laughs> things to them or you know whatever you know and that, and then I would bring it to them, and I wouldn't let them peek. That always mostly girls, actually. I have totally experienced this, by the way. I just want to say before you go on, I have like distinct memories, and I will, I will indulge in the story a little later. But I do have a very, yeah, th- this is true. I'm going to corroborate Paul's story here. That has happened, and he does do this. He'll oh, yeah. disappear, and then he'll create something amazing. It's true. People, they used to say. He used to sort of like poke around the corner. I'd be like very aggressive. Be like, get out. Like, you'll see when it's very done. aggressive. <laughs> I would be. If you asked any of my closest friends, I did that numerous times yeah, for them. Swatted them out. Yeah, well, because I wanted, like any <laughs> yeah. chef, you don't want to be necessarily watched when you're in the middle of making something. And no. it's the most annoying thing Comments when people and... are saying, you know, oh, what's this? Oh, can I, like, just sticking their fingers in your pots or right. whatever? That's you're the, like, I'm creating. I hate that. Step I hate away. that. And it, it's all, it's, yeah, it's like if somebody read half of your short story. Mm-hmm. You know, before you were done, it would be really annoying for an author. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, you're creating. Right. Cool. So yeah, so from a early, very early age, I was doing that, and yeah, it just came very naturally to me to progress into working in that field. Though I wasn't really. Well, what happened actually uh, is, out I, I went to a theater school, right, with you, and <laughs> and I was studying drama and I really enjoyed acting uh, and then over the course of those four years I took a real shine to comedy it was definitely what I was the best at I didn't do very well at um, well drama you know or Shakespearean anything <laughs> but I always I always excelled in comedy and so after grade 12 or during grade 12 the the latter part of grade 11 and the beginning of grade 12 when we were all sort of deciding what we wanted to apply to, how we wanted to move forward, um, it was recommended to me to try to get into this comedy, this one-of-a-kind comedy program that Humber offered. And it was very popular and it was competitive and there were a lot of applicants, but I figured I'll apply to that. So I applied to three programs. I applied to some sort of general arts at York and then I applied to comedy writing and performance, which was like a... you know, numerous applications, um, audition, and all that stuff. Portfolio type stuff. To exactly. Prove, yeah. Uh, and then I and then I also applied to culinary arts, which you didn't really have to say anything for. It was kind of. I like, didn't know you even applied to that. I did. It was oh. one or the other. I knew I was going to go. Where was that at? Uh, I think that was also at Humber. Oh, okay. Humber's culinary arts program, but I so I got into I, that sort of like. A lot of people do. It's mm-hmm. not known for being terribly um, the, the hard to The culinary? Yeah. Oh, you got into it. Okay. And then, but then after the whole arduous process of applying to comedy writing and performance, I ended up getting accepted to that. And so I said, well, there's no way that I can't take that opportunity. <clears throat> it was nerve wracking and it was, it was hard to get into. So, and it was exciting. So I wanted to do that. Yeah. And I was already working in kitchens. So I thought, whatever, I'll keep working in kitchens to make money and then I'll do this for two years and then see where it goes. I think that's an important thing too about you that you've, you, you just recently said to me too, but just about how you, you said you love studying, you have a hunger for, you know, knowledge to, to keep looking for something. So that's not to say that you went to comedy and then you stopped like full stop on all these things that have to do with cooking. You were, you know, you're somebody who I think keeps looking and keeps searching for the information, the knowledge, right? Can you talk oh, yeah, a little bit definitely. like that? Like you just, like your journey didn't stop because you're like, well, well, I guess it wasn't a good program, no, so I didn't go no, to no. it. You kept going. Absolutely. Well, and what, what had happened at, by then was that, and I have to, I have to mention the Food Network because in high school still I became obsessed with the Food Network and in those days the Food Network wasn't as reality TV based as it is now Uh, it was still a lot of 30 minute 
demo style cooking segments, but from all these different people with all these different backgrounds. And I would watch it relig- I would watch it for hours and hours at night and it just absorb, absorb, absorb. I loved it. I loved it. And it was like being in a class. It was like being in a tutorial, you know, because you're just watching demos, you're absorbing, and then you go and you try it. And that's what I would do. So it wasn't really a source of entertainment for you. It was well, a it source was. of... But it, it was but both. It was both. And that's what made it so awesome. Entertainment and education. Yeah. And that's what made... I mean, I'm sure that if I had gone into culinary arts, I would have loved it because for the same reason. But I loved it in my home because there was no pressure. There were no exams. I could watch and then I could pick and choose what really appealed to me and then go try those things. Discover, yeah, just go mess around. Yeah, and I was still, I guess, very young and I was still absorbing very well. So I learned a ton, ton of stuff from just watching that. And and then I started to collect books and I loved collecting cookbooks and of course a lot of online research. And I guess I didn't collect as many books as some people you know, in if chef, if you listen to chefs who are maybe ten years older than me or twenty years older than me, they say they have like libraries of them. I don't have a library. I pick and choose based on a lot of lists that I'd see online and a lot of I'd research which books to invest in, and then the rest of it I would just research online. So mm-hmm. I would spend I spent I I swear to God like six to eight hours straight just getting lost down the rabbit hole of the internet, you know, Mm -hmm. going from one page to another, learning about food history and, you know, food culture and all of that. And so... um, You gave yourself your education. You facilitated that. Yeah, I just... Yeah, I I, I feel like I'm a... a, Yeah, I'm a student for life. And so I love that. And I, I always did love that. And so I just continued to learn on my own time. And also practically, because I never really stopped working in kitchens. Mm, okay. So is there in that vein then, because you still, you know, you're doing school for something, but then you still have this passion, this love for some, for, for another thing, um, you know, with your, you educating yourself and everything, is there a time where you had to fake through in, in the theme of our show, something that, you know, was pretty serious that is your love and you're coming from this place where you're super knowledgeable, but people go, well, you don't have a certificate, which is something I think many people run into. Is there time you can think of that? Absolutely. Uh, well, there's actually two, there's definitely two different, there's, I've done a lot of quote unquote faking it in the sense that, um, yeah, I never went to culinary arts. And so I always, I always got that question, especially in the later years when I started to sell myself and work privately and I would have, it would just be me and or people that I brought in, my team. Um, I would always get stuck with that question, you know. And I mean, that, the thing is there that I never felt like I was faking it because I never felt like I was not knowledgeable or I couldn't execute whatever it is that I was offering or the menus that I were, was writing. Um, but I was always sort of faking the confidence that I guess that piece of paper would give you. And from a very early, very early age, I did struggle with confidence. I was a very overweight kid. I, uh, like, I probably back to dating back to the Pizza Hut days. <laughs> it was downhill <laughs> from there. Oh. But, but I did gain a lot of weight through high school. And then when I went to, well, you can imagine, when I went to comedy writing, we ate a lot of pizza. We drank a lot of beer. I'm sure, yeah. Um, you know, we were very focused on our comedy. The content. Yeah, we weren't, we weren't, there wasn't a whole lot of, no one was interested in really, like, your dating or, or it, like what you looked like it wasn't a concern yeah not really because in the that's comedy interesting, world though, because from the act yeah right i think you're about to, sorry i just cut you off but I, I think that's interesting to hear from other people who are in perf- it's still performance based and that's i think the only performance based schooling or thing that you can do where someone's not going to be like you need to lose weight Absolutely. because they don't really care it's true it's very true well actually and also in the chef world Right, uh, <laughs> because if you're somebody who's a larger person, and I'm gonna be like, you know, food. Yeah, you hear that all I mean, the time. Really, you hear that yeah. all the time. You hear people say, "Never trust a skinny chef." That's not true. <laughs> no, but, of course not. But it's, it's saying for a reason because they don't care. You know what I mean? They don't care at all. Um, and yeah, similarly in the comedy world, um, a lot of you know the the everyone from all different shapes and sizes have their strengths in both of those fields and so anyway no one was really very uh concentrated yeah, concentrated on, that, yeah. on dating or hooking up or all those things that kids were in college we were concentrating on making good comedy your art on yeah. going out and not blowing it on stage um and yeah and we were focused on saving money and so we ate moga's pizza every day for <laughs> like two years uh and drank a bunch of beer because it was the cheapest thing to buy and so 
gained a lot of weight through college to the point where I was, I think, like 265 pounds at one point. Um, and yeah, well, I was definitely 265 pounds because then when I went out, when I finished comedy and I pursued acting for a year, I mean, that's when it got a little hard. I mean, I started to become really uh, rather self-conscious you know because I went from comedy then to acting and then when you're acting and auditioning oh, for things yeah. it's a totally different thing well your 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 weight will actually typecast exclusively you. typecast you absolutely and I was typecast as nothing funny I was typecast as bully goon burglar mugger oh my uh, God. guy offering little girl twizzlers in a public service announcement so I was <laughs> like I was like yeah this is not for me did you feel embarrassed about that yeah like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah like for this sure. is not my experience of what I can offer it's just yeah and so then dumb. I started I started to what I would do is I would I, I in the in the on the train of faking it mm -hmm. <clears throat> I felt like what I would do is I would really fake my confidence because I said you know I'm not gonna get well at the time a girlfriend or uh or, you know, a good job or anything if I come across as unconfident, as unconfident as I am in my own head. Mm. And so I, I was really, I became really good at doing that, you know, and later in life, uh, well, actually, when I was around 21, 21, I think I started, I went on this, I had this sort of epiphany and I said, you know what, I need to lose some weight because I'm sort of sick of faking it. And I, I just want to feel better in my own skin. Right. <clears throat> Did you feel like sad and, and yeah. in that vein? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was depressed and not terribly so. Like, I, I wasn't as depressed as some other people that I've spoken to have gone through the same things. Uh, you just based... didn't feel as good as you could have. Right. You knew you could. Yeah. And so then I, I, ended up, I ended up losing 70 pounds in like nine months, hmm. between nine months and a year. And it, it, it came through cooking for myself. Right. So I stopped going out. I completely cut. I mean, it was a, it was a huge flip. Life, lifestyle change. Like, that's the only way you could put Absolutely. it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It was, I stopped eating pizza. I stopped drinking. I didn't drink beer for a year. I drank, n I, I drank nothing at a bar except vodka soda. Uh, I drank nothing at home besides water or soda water. Or I guess occasionally milk. You know, I didn't drink juices or pops or anything. Any empty calories or whatever. Right. You just went completely pretty Rambo cold turkey. On your own. Yeah. yeah. And then I was exercising anyway. And then as soon as I saw a huge difference from that, oh, it was also right when I moved out of my mom's house, and I noticed that. Well, thinking back now, my mom in those days bought a lot of very rich European foods. We always had lots of cheese. You know, uh, we always had. Uh, bagels and bread and lots of carbs um rich foods delicious things but stuff that we would eat. You're, if you're consistently eating that all oh yeah all and late day. at night if you catch my drift and so we would <laughs> we would end up I, Ooh, I, I, cheese I, wheel right <laughs> well, I'll, I'll have, have that those. Yeah. and so uh yeah this was right when i moved out of my mom's house and i moved into my grandmother's house and she would let me go to the grocery store and say, okay, I want this, this, and this. Now buy whatever you want. And so it was my first sort of foray into the world of shopping for myself. And I wasn't on some huge budget. So it wasn't like I was going, like I was suddenly in the big city, had this budget, had to go to the store, and I'm buying whatever's on sale or hot dogs or and mac and cheese because I need to save the money. My grandma would give me, you know, whatever, like 60 or 80 bucks, go to the store and do a week's worth of shopping or maybe more. And then I could buy all this fresh produce and I could cook because... I had the kitchen to myself pretty much and I would just have to cook for her and so that really transformed my body mm -hmm. because I could control what I was putting in putting it, in it. Yeah. yeah and so uh that's when I came to Toronto which also it was a huge shift for me and a huge sort of new chapter in my life and then uh yeah and then I lost all that weight and I just I started feeling much more real you know in my confidence and then so did it stop fate like it sort of faded away your faking parts of it into like did you one day just realize like wow I actually feel as confident as I put out yeah did that just like you just felt like that one day sort of not I don't know if it was one day or there was Gradually. one summer where I just started I started getting more attention from people people were taking me more seriously I was also growing up you know I was suddenly 22 and I wasn't 18 anymore you know like and, and yeah, so I, I started to feel like I was getting more respect, not necessarily in the food world, 
or, personally, in your personal life. Yeah, but in my personal life, which does translate into everything else. And, Absolutely. And so, and also my, my, I must say, my training in improv and theater certainly helped me along the way. Like it, it, uh, anyone who's trained in improv, as you know, you, it, it, it it makes you a much better speaker. It makes you quicker on your feet. Totally. It, and that helps. That certainly helps with both faking it and real confidence. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like I did quite a bit of faking it over the years. But in, in, in essence, I think through growing up. But I think what you're saying too, like you see that the faking part of it continued as you grew up. But like, do you feel as well that there's ever an instance that you do that still? Because oh, yeah. I feel like I do it, like, there's days when someone will ask me something, and if it's like, I really want to make sure that I can prove to this person in a business sense, th- I want to take advantage of this opportunity, I want to, and not that I think like, oh, shit, I'm definitely not capable of this, and I'm going to screw this person over. If somebody asks me something, and I know this is a great challenge, there is elements of faking it in that. Absolutely. Because you're like, I don't know if I know how to make that dish, or if I know how to actually, you know, complete this thing that you're asking me for in business or in whatever, mm-hmm. but I want to forge a, a opportunity to complete it, and then you learn from it, and hopefully it's scary as hell, but you just hold your breath and hope you do well. Oh, yeah. Oh, fa- absolutely. So after, when I moved to Toronto, I decided to go pursue uh, an undergrad degree, an honors degree in communication, and... Um, Partially because I could do the degree relatively cheap because my mom was working uh, as a researcher at York. And so I got a benefit only till I was 25. So I thought, okay, now's my last chance. I'm going to go do this because why not? And I had and I found that communications, a lot of the communications courses were also really good in making me a better speaker, a better performer, a better presenter. And I had this one professor who taught all the... um, interpersonal communication courses and they were the best they were the best courses because so much of what i learned is so applicable all the time to life interpersonal everything in in business in your family life in your social life is spontaneously all over the place in your social life and so one thing that he said was and this is so funny because it so applies here he said if you ever get offered a job and you don't think that you can do it take the job and then figure it out Totally. Yeah. I, that's fantastic. <laughs> and he, he's just really, you know, successful. He was already uh, semi-retired, uh, whatever you call it, um, professor oh. emeritus or whatever. Yeah, and, I know what but, you mean. But he, and he was obviously a very smart guy, great communicator, r- literally written the books on interpersonal <laughs> communication. And, uh, and when he said that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I mean, that's kind of scary. But he said, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? That's you, right. You, I mean, unless, uh, to it to a point. I mean, you wouldn't Well, there's want a lot to, of bad things. Like, yeah, I don't want to go and building. be like, yeah, I can do that air traffic control <laughs> job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm educated in that. And then people die. That's not good. But, yeah, you just clench your ass and go for it. Exactly. <laughs> and I have, always go, ooh, and then you just run. And I carry that with me. So good. when I started to, and this is jumping forward a little, but when I started to take on my own jobs where I was the sole person responsible for them, I I sort of thought about that every now and then. And there were times of anxiety when I'm like, what am I doing? I'm in over my head. You know, I've never done this before. Pretty much I've never done anything for a client or for a paying customer that I've never done before. But sometimes I've done things that I've only done once before. One test run. Yeah. And it's always worked for me, knock on wood. <laughs> but... um. But it's because I do have a certain, I feel that I have a certain um, knack for it. It's always come naturally to me to some degree, cooking. And there are so many great resources today. You know what I mean? Like, totally. It's, it's, it's not going to the library and you're like, you have to spend hours there. Your exactly. Computer, I, mean, I could find something. If I was in the heat of a service and I needed to figure something out, which I never do because I'm too obsessive compulsive. I have everything written preparing down and all that, in binders yeah. before. But if I needed to, I could Google something. Like I could ask Siri for something. You know what I mean? I could I could figure something out very quickly. Right. And so, and I feel like I'm very resourceful. I'm very good at using the resources that I have at my disposal, which are greater than they've ever been before. So, yeah. So I I have I have used that, and I have you know sort of felt like I was faking it, sort of. But through things. <laughs> but you know what? And then, but when you succeed in doing something like that, when you pull it off, and you have these wonderful satisfied clients you know who are talking the world about you and spreading your business word of mouth you're like 
hmm, that doesn't feel like I was faking it. That feels like I said I could do it and I did it, right? Exactly. And you just succeed in it. Mm-hmm. So currently right now, you're not working at a food establishment in terms of making something every day, but how does cooking and, and you being a chef for hire and everything, how does that fit into your life right now? Back when uh, I was working in restaurants, I mean, I quickly learned how horrible it can be in terms of work-life balance. Uh, like, Is that like largely the weekend scenario where you're like we- late nights all weekend? Yeah, evenings and weekends, missing plans largely hanging out with the with the kitchen and front of house community which is a lot of late night like really late nights like i'm not talking like reasonable late nights like i'm five and six a.m oh, in yeah. the morning or, or more because yeah. in some cases you don't get off until two three in the morning and then you're you're wired and you want to unwind and a lot of the people that work in that industry they're into all sorts of stuff and so it's it's very um, it's very easy to get tangled in that, get carried away, get burnt out very easily because you're working long shifts. And I also didn't, I've never been, I've never liked being told what to do. Like it's always, I've always been, uh, resistant to authority of any kind. And while I feel like I'm a good, I'm a good student, like when someone's teaching me, then I'm very receptive when I'm being ordered around or being disrespected, which happens so much in kitchens. And a lot of people consider it to be, you know, you earning your stripes or, you know, climbing the ladder, whatever. But it's abusive. I hated it. I hated it. And there's this whole culture of that. And it's people are starting to talk about it, like, just now, you know, in, for example, the Toronto food scene and, and beyond. And it's really there. And I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Some guys were just such assholes and... I, I just didn't like it at all. So I, I worked in restaurants. I worked I worked in a well, banquet hall for a short amount of time. I worked in catering a lot since I was also very young. And then... <clears throat> Why was that, though? Is that through the Estonian community? Yes. Okay. Pretty much. It was yeah. through a family friend, Chef Susie Holmberg, who was a great mentor to me. Like, I started working with her. She called me to work with her when I was really, really young probably around the Pizza Hut days, or maybe earlier. I don't even remember. It was a long time ago. And then I sort of stuck with her. Like, she'd call me whenever she needed me, and I just loved working with her because she treated me with respect. She was a friend, you know? Again, she would, like, let me drink beer on our break (laughs) when I was, like, 17 or whatever and give me the occasional smoke. But but I just loved the way she treated me, you know? And I loved learning from her. And so I worked with her for many, many years, and I'll still work with her if she needs me. Uh, and she's worked with me now, uh, cool. which is awesome. And we've collaborated on functions, huge, a uh, huge function, for example. But um, so that environment sort of really impacted you in terms of like the positivity and negativity of it was just so outbalanced that yeah, yeah, that's a huge thing. We talked about that in another episode, our last one with the uh, web series creator Jason Lever, who mm-hmm. was just like he he models his sets after a certain way, which I liken it the same thing. A lot of stuff is going on, high pressure. You got a lot of things to get finished and done. And if you're not nice, like really, it comes back to just being a decent human being. And that that doesn't mean that just because you're the director that you can push around the person who's, you know, serving you coffee. Of course not. Like it's just not right. Not to mention, there's one thing I hate about restaurants. Like I love the idea of restaurants. I don't go to a lot of restaurants and people always ask me, like, what's your favorite restaurant? But I don't go to them because I love to cook for myself a lot. And price point being very familiar with price points. Of course, you would know that so well. It's very easy to be disappointed if you're being served crap. Um, and, but there's a lot of waste, like there's a lot of waste involved and I don't like it. It's this, like, it's this overindulgent lifestyle. Like you should be able to get whatever you want, whenever you want. That's why I have such great respect for restaurants like, like Layton Crawford's Ruby Watch Co, where the, the menu changes every day. Because of what is available. What is available. You can't just, yeah. And then they buy enough for that day. That's why that's I love it. catering yeah. because I know how much I need. I buy a little extra. So often the client gets a little bit extra or for unforeseen guests or whatever, but that's it. Like, we don't waste anything because if there's any extra, people take it home. Right. In a restaurant. And just frankly, it can't be like that. We need to reframe our thoughts about of course. the way that is. It's because it's just disgusting. It is un- unsustainable. I've yeah. worked in a very, you know, worked in a grocery store like a lot of kids did. And w- I was mortified at that age before I knew any really of the world's issues that, like, or like you know, environmentally, how much is thrown out. Oh, yeah. It's, it's 
yeah, it's soul crushing. But anyways, yeah. So basically, you're moving on to doing catering, young age. You continue to do that, and it's something you you really like. So cooking's in your life as well. People will hire you for a lot of things, like birthdays or like events right and yeah you, you enjoy doing that kind of stuff yeah people started to well what happened was then i ended up going to work at uh a summer camp by my cottage um and i well i worked there as a counselor for a couple of years and then the head cook uh left the head cook of many years left and uh they asked me if i would be interested in taking it over and i would that's a great example of one time when I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I think I was... Because you're like a kid. Yeah, I was, I was young. I was like 19 or something. But but I was thinking, you know, that might be so much fun. And it's funny, when you're in that community, people are always saying like, oh, the kitchen people have it the best. Like, they get midday breaks and they can go to the pool or whatever. Whereas the counselors are sorry, on from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Like, long, long days. And, <clears throat> and I thought, I'd like to try my hand at that. And then... I decided to collaborate with a good friend of mine, Christina Call, who helped us with food styles. Yes, she, yeah. Maybe that's a great project I'll talk to. We'll fill you guys in in a bit. She said, uh, well, how would you like to do it together? And she's even younger than I am. And so we kind of You thought, wouldn't know. Yeah, she's yeah. so confident and like... Yeah, and so I thought, you know, maybe if we do do this together, we can pull it off because, you know, I'll have her back, she'll have mine, and, you know, I think we can do this. And do it better than it's been done before. Not so much camp food, but fresh food and mm-hmm. nice things. And so we just, we applied, we put together a proposal and we, they said yes. And we got to, we got to play. Like we got to do whatever we wanted and we nailed it, which was awesome. That was probably the moment where I said, you know, I can do this because, because we really took a plunge there. And if I had screwed up or if it had been a disaster. Well, like hundreds of kids would be like. Yeah, I would have been, I would have been like drop this and yeah. move on to something else and so, right. so that was a big test that was a kind of a deciding moment yeah and then we went back again and it was even better and then <clears throat> yeah and then after that people started to ask you know can you cater this event can you do this can you do this party for me and whatnot and so I wasn't advertising I didn't really want to be a caterer I remember Susie saying to me or me saying to Susie I think I'm gonna go to culinary school and I think I'm gonna be a caterer I think this is for me and she was like don't do it. You'll break your back. You'll die. <laughs> not not quite in those words, but she she says you know it's essentially really really hard. really hard, mm-hmm. and you need to be prepared for that because like the long standing shifts, you can cause all sorts of like knee and back problems, oh, yeah, and health problems, too, all yeah. sorts of things. <clears throat> not to mention working in catering, then you got all the travel involved. Tons of it. Yeah. And so you you're got, not just going to a restaurant each day. You're right. And so yeah. it, it it so it's, it's it's strenuous in a different way, and so. I was doing the sort of one-off catering things for people, and again, only through word of mouth, only through word of mouth getting um, business, and then that sort of takes me till I was around maybe 23, yeah, 23, 24, 23, I guess, because um, still through this whole time, I was a huge fan of the Food Network, Um, huge fan like would watch it all the time and by this time I'm living in Toronto with my best friend Carly and we together would watch like Food Network shows religiously and we watched Chopped a lot the American Chopped and um and she said you know you got to go on this show you got to go on this show like we would we would watch this show and put bets on people <laughs> and we'd bet you know 5 minute massages or whatever it was <laughs> like and and then it would be really exciting cuz it'd be like our version of the Super Bowl which we had no interest in. <laughs> and uh, The cooking bowl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she said, you got to go on this show. Like, I think you could really, really do well at this. And so I, of course, I tried. I, I applied. Uh, well, I tr- actually, I looked into applying, but you had to be an American citizen. And this was around the time that the Food Network started to get more into these reality-based shows. Um, like, they were becoming way more common than Prominent the tutorial than the, yeah. shows. Which is funny. That's kind of when I started to wean. I don't know if it was because I started to... I was learning so much, or I had learned so much already, and then by that time I was learning so much in the field working, um, that I then started to sort of like wean off of it, but we watched Chop like mad, and then one day, my friend Carly, I guess, texted me and said, uh, Chop is coming to Canada, you have to apply. I said, I was sort of like hemming and hawing, like, again, I didn't know whether I was up to the task, I and I thought... 
am I am I good enough to apply? Will I just get rejected? Another thing that I hate, I hate failure and I hate being rejected. So I was like, oh, I don't know, this is risky. So I reluctantly, sort of with a twisted arm, applied. I mean, the original application wasn't very hard, so I, it was like, whatever, you know, half an hour. I filled out the, the little application and then I sent it. And then I didn't, th I didn't think about it. Kind of like I, I, what I learned in my days of auditioning, you go, you do it, you put it out of your mind. If you get a call, then you start worrying about it. If you don't, then just never think about it again. Just move on, yeah. <clears throat> right. And then, sure enough, I got a phone call. Um, I got a phone call. It's weird. I got a phone call asking me to do a phone interview at a different time. <laughs> like, why did you call me? Like, but thank you. <laughs> Obviously, I was excited. Oh, I was like, "All yeah, right, I'll be there." And I didn't know. I thought, "I, I thought, oh my god, like maybe I'm. This is my chance, you know. I aced the phone interview, and then I'll get in." So I get the day comes, and this is like the most long process, you know. You got, you know, between well, your for TV, they vet you like incessantly. Oh, and it takes. It was like this is like we're Months. talking like a six to eight month process because there's the initial application. Wait, 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 and this phone call, which was very long, like. It was like an hour and a half long. Then that was done. I again tried to put it out of my mind. And then we I, I just waited, waited, waited. And then it's weird. I got the phone call for the phone interview. But then I got a email for the in-person interview. <laughs> so I'm like... And then I, so many I, interviews. So many <laughs> interviews. And that was the in-person, on-camera audition interview, I think is the way that they put it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And so then I really started freaking out because you're getting, it was cool. you know, you're it in was it. becoming you're in more pool. real, yeah. right? So I go down and I do the in-person interview, and and at again at that interview I was talking about this work that I had done, and I'm like, well, I mean, I've worked in food for a long time. You know, people have paid me to do to do work for them. I mean, I've run a kitchen. I've Worked in numerous different places. I, I can make off the top of my head hundreds and hundreds of different dishes. Like, but still, in that interview, you got cameras and lights on you, and you got this person asking all these questions. And I'm thinking in, in inside, am I am I worthy of being here? Like, is this like? But I was talking about my life, and I guess they it's also TV, so they're looking for a certain amount of charisma, and charm, some edge and, of some sort. Yeah, their, their angle they can have on yeah. you because they balance out the whole you're, who's yeah. competing. Oh yeah, and your ability to do um, to be on camera and not look like a total like idiot a troll, or crumble yeah. or have an anxiety <laughs> attack, right? Right. Because uh, that would waste a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And also, they were really focusing on the like. I guess I told them at the time that I had a boyfriend and that, I, and they're like. Oh, you're gay, and I think the guy that interviewed me was gay. And oh, so interesting. Okay. He's like, oh well. He's like, how would you, how much would you say your being gay has affected your food style? And I'm like, <laughs> not at all. Like, gee. <laughs> but but maybe if you'll cast me, like, yeah. you know, in my oh, head, yeah, I cook very gay. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> mostly should, mostly I, pinks and yellow. Yeah, I cook very very gay. Rainbows <laughs> so, everywhere. So yeah, I don't how even, silly, but anyway. I, I don't so. even remember what I said. I don't even think that was a part of your whole your whole thing. No, I... Like, even as a character on the show and watching it... Oh, you, it wasn't, because I didn't give them anything. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like it doesn't. Does but they're just looking for a plot. So, right. <laughs> so anyway, they ended up... Um, I guess they ended up going with the whole, like, I'm Estonian plot, because that's equally rare. So, <laughs> rarer, actually. So, yeah. anyway, and then, and then... So I had that whole interview and mind you this was exactly this took me back to my acting days i'm sitting in this like waiting room with all these nervous folks who are more nervous than the actors i used to be in the waiting rooms with because at least the actors were used to it these yeah, are well, all these chefs are people who are just or, in kitchens exactly and they're like, I'm, what? oh they're Camera. sweating Freaking, and rubbing yeah. their hands and looking at papers and anyway so i did it it was it took forever it was so long i walked out of that studio and again and i called my mom and of course like, the biggest mistake you make when you're auditioning or trying out or interviewing is telling people because then they're like, how did it go? Oh, my God, what's yeah. going on? Like, and so, I was course, so surprised you hadn't told me until you were like, this is going to happen mm -hmm. when you had, like, a show. Like, basically, you were on it and it was finished. You also weren't supposed to yeah, tell anyone. Yeah, because I'm sure you had to sign agreement. Because and then something. once you, if you get accepted, then you're not supposed to. It, it was also the first episode ever in Canada. I mean, sorry, it, episode season. for ch season of Chopped yes. Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So they were really, it was all really like, hush, hush, like, yeah. Hush, hush, yeah. 
So that happened, you know, again, I wait forever, another probably two months or so. And I thought it's done. And then, you know, by that time I had convinced myself that it wasn't happening. And I was kind of like reveling in the like, oh, this is not happening. I have nothing to worry about. And then one day I'm at home and I was actually cooking for, uh, for Alex, Carly and Scott. And they, and I get this email and I'm kind of like bracing myself on the kitchen counter and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> and I'm like, it's happening. It's happening. And I gave them the phone and then everybody freaks out. And then, and that's when, what the, does it say that like, like you've been, you've chosen. been selected to compete on season one of Trap Canada. <clears throat> Stay tuned for more details. <laughs> Call you in three months. No, oh not God. actually. No, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they, uh, I got that email and then, and that's when the real horror set in. Because, really? Oh yeah, because then. Oh, I guess because it's not something then, where you're like, what you've already done has been achieved and done. It's finished. Oh, you're you just get like, no credit oh, this for is... being accepted. Right. Then you go on on the national television. And anything can happen. And you could totally screw up. I've seen people slice both hands. I've seen people oh, bleed God, into the what? food they serve to the judges, and oh. then they get reprimanded and they're crying. I've seen tears and all this stuff. And I can't so, handle those shows, just BT dubs, too high energy. I mean, too high drama for me. And I, I, I finish the show and I'm like, I'm stressed right now. I like watching that. I'm I, stressed. The, idea of, <laughs> the like, idea of being on it was terrifying. Yeah. And then the like so the nightmares setting. began. Oh, you didn't? Really? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Did you like get, chop your hands off and chopped in your No, dreams? it was like timer running out, timer running out, you know, giant clock spinning, like, because God, it's a it's timed like they should competition. should give you some, like, psychology uh, appointments well, when you get chosen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And Along I, with therapy. I mean, I probably would have needed therapy had it gone worse than <laughs> True, it did. True, yeah. But, uh, and I, I can't imagine, like, I saw, I've seen people, like, Luda get, or... like, destroyed on that oh. show by the judges, by the so pressure. It's career, too. Like, you're going on there with your whole career. Your oh, my name, reputation. Your reputation on the, is... on the line. If I make a fool out of myself, no one's going to hire me. Like, it's one no. thing if you work in a restaurant and nobody really knows who you are. Just... I sell me. Yeah. And and by that time, I knew that I didn't want to do catering, catering anymore. It was like, like I want to be a chef. I want to be, a... I want to do fine cuisine for people that are willing to pay for it. So, at that time, I was doing, you know, private dinner parties, you know, for people that are willing to pay restaurant prices or higher to have that experience in their home, have them a menu designed for a, a special person on for a special event, occasion, whatever like, it you is. know, it's yeah. your wife's 40th birthday. What are her five favorite things? Let's make her a tasting menu that is literally hers. The fa- Yeah. Yeah. The, the so, all time faves. And I, I'm thinking I can sell that, not waste food, you know, not work every single evening and weekend. And, and, and so that's sort of what I was doing. And so I was like, this is very important that I do well here. And so then it, the day came, the day came and I, all I knew to do was get a really good night's sleep, like as good as I could and then eat, actually run. I went to the local track and I sprinted, which I don't, I don't love sprinting. Like it's painful, but I knew that I, I know that sprinting gets, is a great yeah. way to alleviate anxiety. Too. You and, got everything going. Exactly. And to wake up. I yeah, was up at is, three o'clock yeah. that morning. And I think that's so much a part of the cooking aspect is you're using your 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 scone. You're using yeah, your absolutely. brain. Absolutely. And so you think quick in the timer. So you went for the run. That makes sense. Yeah, I wanted to wake up because we had to be at the studio by six. Ew. And it was way downtown by the waterfront. And so I had I, I gave myself three hours to get up, go for a run, get cleaned up. Uh, have a great breakfast, bre- breakfast as, uh, eat as well as I could. I wasn't terribly hungry, but I think I had... Do you a, remember what you ate? I, uh, no. I think I had a really, really good protein shake, like high protein. I had some fruit and I had some, I don't know, yogurt and some sort of... Lots of protein. Low fiber. Uh, <laughs> probably, yeah. I didn't have bran or any sort of grains. Oh, poo and, jokes. And... and <laughs> And so, funny enough, that didn't come up all day. Oh, but, okay. uh, that's good. <laughs> so I get down there and I'm like listening to like Titanium, which had just come out, <laughs> like so loud, trying to pump myself up. And I get down there and I, uh, I parked and I was really early. Also, from my acting days, I would always get always everywhere early. super early. Yep. Same with catering, same with everything. You gotta be there early because then if you're running late, you still have 25 minutes. I'd rather mess. sit in exactly. the car and listen to the radio. Anyway, so I got there early. So I was, by the door five minutes before I go in. Oh, and it's funny. I get in there and the one of the competitors, um, Eric, who uh, 
he was like the definitely the most experienced competitor. He was in the green room when they took me in there, sharpening a knife like an executioner. <laughs> and he's bald and I've never met him I'm before. Like, and he was happening? like he's just like sing, sing. And I'm like, Good morning. <laughs> Anyway, later, like over, over the course of the day, <laughs> yeah. we got to know each other really well. And he's like, oh, I was totally doing that to try to, <laughs> try to intimidate anyone no that came way. in. Oh, That's it's all strategy. He was, a, he was a great guy. Awesome. But um, despite the way they made him look on the show, which was kind of shitty. Um, That's crappy at the end of it. The, the yeah. editing really shapes people. Yeah. I mean, on one hand, you have to be very careful what you say when you're there getting all this information. I certainly was worried about it until I saw the show because I, I gave them... Hours and hours of interviews saying all sorts of stuff about my sexuality, about my... This was at a time when I wasn't very open, and I was like... I was just trying to differentiate myself by okay. admitting all that stuff. It wasn't because I was like... But then were you kind of worried about what they use? <clears throat> yeah, I was a little worried. Um, also, I didn't want... I mean, surely in hours of saying stuff on camera, you in some statements you look silly or, you know, you come across as not that smart. Or, anyway, lucky for me... Uh, they really painted me in a nice light. They surely didn't use some of the stuff that made me look bad. But um, for him, they picked a lot of things that he... I mean, they made him look like more of a villain, mm. which is all about the narrative they were trying to That's weave. Right, yeah. uh, but anyway, I mean, he's done very well, and he's really, really talented. So that's all in the past. But uh, yeah, so we got in there. We got a fairly brief tour of the kitchen. Uh, we got to have like a bottle of water and a muffin and then and then it started like right away and the whole process took about 12 hours it was very um it was very intense they took it very seriously obviously but to the point where there's like producers like walking around with us being like chef's moving like you know chef's in the corridor chef's going i wanted to go for a cigarette at one point and they're like chef going for a cigarette and i'm like do we really have to like <laughs> but uh and then <laughs> But they, it's because they didn't want you to see anything that would give you an advantage. They didn't want you to see any ingredients or whatever. Oh, so they're like blocking things off to make it like in case they get like a rogue sneaky sneaker. Who's well, yeah. Around to figure yeah. out. And they're trying to keep track of you. Octopus? Oh, no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. I yeah. mean, that would be a huge advantage in that show, right? For, for sure, yeah. And so... Well, yeah. like the premise for people who haven't seen it, the premise is that you're coming and getting mystery ingredients. Yeah. Can you just quickly touch on that? It's called a black box it. tournament. Or a black box challenge. Um, it's like a classic, uh, like chef school um, exercise mm -hmm. where you get a box, a black box, or in this case, a basket that has four mystery ingredients, and then you get a certain time limit. Appetizers twenty minutes, uh, entree dessert are both thirty. You get that specific amount of time to combine all of those plus anything else that's in the like extensive pantry, like thousands of ingredients, to make whatever that dish is and then you present it to judges for judging and uh yeah and it's based on creativity um taste and plating okay and there's three different dishes you have to three make. different dishes right yeah. app entree dessert so uh remind me too I, I have seen the entire episode but I, I can't remember if do they give you different ingredients for each um each thing oh yeah like yeah. each app yeah. yeah and they gave you they give you weird ingredients to throw you off yeah, my, typically they give you like some random wild card thing right my episode was called just desserts so the for the appetizer and the entree they were weird desserts or treats and then for dessert it was like an anti-dessert ingredient so for the appetizer i got uh, like strawberry snack cake, they call it, which was like this pinwheel, like Little Debbie or whatever, gross pink fluorescent little cake. Um, and then for the entree, I got cherry pop rocks. And then for dessert, I got uh, relish, <laughs> like right. pickled relish. So, so yeah. So it was kind of a blur, or did you remember everything still? Like, I swear, I, I remember. I think I remember everything. Like some parts were a blur, like, but. I had Suzer Lee, who I saw. It's funny, when we got there, I saw, I guess there were three, either, I think they were three members of the production team sitting in the judges' seats. So I, like, I recognized the set because it looked very much like the American version. I actually thought it looked nicer. It was more colorful. And uh, 
newer looking and the american version had already been on for many many seasons and so i got there and i looked at the judges chairs and here are these three people and i'm like who the hell is that like i was hoping for some familiar faces the canadian judges <laughs> i'm like oh this man is a like stand owner no. <laughs> this is a man who sells beaver tails <laughs> in kensington market so i saw them and i was like i was like oh boy and then who the fuck are you and then we do this little tour go into the sequester room they called it which is where we were taken in and out while they were like replacing plates and doing whatnot it was like right next to the judges table but like a room of its own and then we come out again and as we're walking to where we do at the beginning of the show that you do this long walk down this hallway so as we're film you and it's like this right it's this whole dramatic like entrance but as we're going back to to take our marks for the beginning of that shot i guess eric and maybe terrence uh, saw Suzer Lee, and they're like, "Holy shit, Suzer! Holy shit, Suzer!" And so I'm like, you, "I'm like, oh, oh boy!" Am and I this like, is a chef who you're very. This is a chef who I'm very familiar with. He's like, he's world renowned, and he is a, like probably the most famous chef in Toronto. Um, and does he have a restaurant here? Yeah, he has, he has many restaurants. Oh, does he? Uh, Suzer and Lee and a bunch more. He just opened Frings with Drake. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't read that. He's, news, uh, I missed out on that. He's very, <laughs> Frings. He's, he's very famous. Cool. And so, uh, long story short, when I knew that he was there, then I was like, oh man, this is real. Like, gotta bring it, gotta bring it, gotta bring it. And, uh. Did that energize you or did that just make you, uh, like obviously you didn't wilt under the pressure because you, you know, kicked ass. But... It's weird because I, um, I don't remember being that nervous when I was there. It's like, it's like I had gone through so much nerves you know leading up to this much like when you're in a the production or right. when there's an audition or when you so like, it's go time lead, so it's go time exactly okay. i always perform seem to perform well under pressure the biggest nerves come right before whether that was in stand-up it's always been you know this lead-up is awful and then once you're on stage and you get your first laugh or you in this case get your first ingredient and you actually know or have it. an idea or something oh, yeah. what to do with your life exactly then you're like this is great okay, like, like when go. you know like, an answer on a test yeah right exactly and you're just like i know that exactly I or if you saw the first question on an exam and you're like oh that's familiar then suddenly you just sort of relax a little and then take it on so that happened we went out um i did really well in the first round lucky what for was me your, what was your uh, dish that you did oh so we got duck breast we got cherry pop rocks um jicama and well chili sauce it was sriracha sauce but you know they're not allowed to use like (laughs) brands or or logos and so uh and so i ended up making just a sort of a very simple you know seared crispy skin duck breast salad with uh like an arugula salad and i made this um with strawberry puree because the snack cake was strawberry jelly filled i figured out or i noticed or i don't know what the hell happened but i was like this is strawberry so i had tasted it and um and i had toasted it or tried to toast it but it just got really really gooey Mm -hmm. so i'm like oh my god what do i do with this and then i ended up whisking it with strawberry puree it was the only time i think i saw you really just not panicked but like i saw a thing in you where you were like i gotta move quick like there was just a moment where you looked in you're like "Mm." and i'm like (laughs) Like, they have this amazing shot of me squishing yeah (laughs) squishing with my like giant sausage fingers these these little like blobs of uh snack cake that had come out of the oven and i'm like oh in your head you're going oh no yeah and then i was like I, I you're watching this giant clock go down and i just threw them into this it had started as a as a strawberry vinaigrette and so what i'd done was i took i had this big bowl of vinaigrette that was supposed to be dressing the salad and then i took half of it dressed the salad put it on the plates and then the rest of it i whisked the like gooey cake into it and it made it into a glaze which at first it looked terrible it was right. lumpy and it looked curdled and then it started to sort of emulsify which was amazing and then i could just like spread it sort of i, I sort of yeah. yeah i sort of just drizzled a line over the duck breast and it, it was this nice sort of burgundy color anyway it came together in a way that i could have <laughs> never expected and 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 i got really good feedback for my duck breast uh as opposed to some of the other guys and so after that first round like the the nicest part i must say was going into that room and knowing that i wasn't going home the first round just based on the feedback alone and we all did yeah because we had we had been there for it all we listened to it and then so sure enough it wasn't me and then we did the second round which was the entree which for which we got oh and this is where they said at at 
at the beginning, they were trying to get I think, the narrative going, and they had asked that. They asked me about my heritage, and I said that I was Estonian, and they said, well, if you make it to the next round, you know, we want to see some of that. And so I was thinking, oh, man, there are a million and one ingredients that I don't know how I would weave into an Estonian dish whatsoever. Right. You know, anything. There was a judge Asian that expressed Indian, to you, like, didn't they? A yeah. judge expressed that they really liked. Yeah, in your remote, she... I guess her husband is in some part Estonian. Yeah, some sort of connection. Yeah, and so she said, you know, if you get, you make it there, try try to try to show it up, try to showcase that. And so, so in my head, I'm thinking, I'm gonna get oyster sauce. I'm going to get miso. I, I, well, actually, miso I could probably do, but I'm gonna get something really funky, you know, that and you, I, that you I, can't work in. I, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that I don't know how. I, in, at the time, it's funny now that I'm saying these you're things. Like, I I'm like, that. I know exactly how I would do that. But <laughs> at that time, you're like, shit, shit, shit. I don't yeah. know. And then, sure enough, through some alignment of the stars, I get salmon, like a whole salmon, bones in and everything. I get a whole sockeye salmon. Um, sockeye salmon, cloudberry compote, which is just like any other jam, mm-hmm. which. Like, there's nothing more Eastern European than preserves. Yeah. Um, uh, what the hell else was there? Put it in brine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, morel mushrooms. Uh, oh, wild you... forest mushroom. But that's something you work with tons, too, well, right? Well, I, I you forage them behind... for them at the cottage. And and then uh, something else. I can't even remember what the other thing. So were you, like, really excited when oh, you got... Oh, the pop rocks. Yes, right, the pop rocks. Were you super excited? Oh, when, when I saw, saw them, I was like, this is so Estonian. Like, so Estonian. It was and a so setup. I made a. That's what it looked. People are like, "How did you get the?" I'm like, "I swear to God, I didn't." I didn't do it. I didn't set it up. But uh, but it was just super coincidence. It just worked, you know. It would have worked for a ton of different cultures, but for me, I was thinking, yeah, I could really work with this, and so I I ended up making a, a pretty good dish. Um, I overcooked my salmon, which to this day it's like one of those, man, like, and they really, really it's focused on it. Side. Yeah, <laughs> it was like. I think at one point Vikram Vidge, who I also really respected, he was he's like huge Canadian chef, and he was on Dragons Den, and he said something like, "I think Chef Paul's salmon was so dry he should have left it in the sea." Oh, and I'm like, "Ooh, that hurts!" But <laughs> ouch, ouch. <laughs> but S- salmon jab. Yeah. So what did you end up making? Oh, I made well, I made I made sauerkraut mm-hmm. with uh with the cloudberry compote for sweetness and and some vinegars and. Um, caraway, and then I I did just like a simple seared salmon. Salmon's so easy to like it could overcook like that. Yeah, and very so quick. Yeah. I I just left it in the oven a few minutes too long, uh, but I made uh, you know dill caper lemon creme fraiche for the top of it, which ended up being the saving grace because if I hadn't put that on, it would have been too dry. There's some moisture there, so you're gonna end up having a little. Yeah, bit, and know. I just made some butter basted uh, you know white wine sautéed morels. Um, and I think I used the pop rocks to add sweetness also to the sauerkraut, so it's super Estonian. Oh my god, you should have heard the music they put. Well, you did. You, I did. You I did hear it. It's yeah. like this. I don't even know what it was. Some sort of like wooden flute music. It sounded <laughs> like, like what? It sounded it? like green sleeves or something. Like something <laughs> like like Elizabethan that they'd be playing on some cobblestone walkway. Where's the lute? Where when did the lute come Seriously? in? But I did. Yeah, and. It was just so cheesy. So, <laughs> so you did well in that round as well because the lady was really, I forget the judge, but she was really and, great and grateful that you did yeah, the Estonian. She Sunday liked spin. that and, you know, Scissor Lee really liked it. And uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I didn't do very well. It was a close call between yeah. me and another guy. But For the, entree, the other yeah. guy sort of, who is also great and somebody that I really admire, Terrence, too. These are all people, too, that when they go over their backgrounds, they all, like most of them own their restaurants is that not true yeah well yeah or they the com- competitors against i you. think that one of them did eric definitely did he was he's like a an opener he like he's like he like goes and like puts the restaurant into business yeah, and right. then he moves on and does it again yes, and again yes. and again he's super well they had like really talented. impressive like professional you know i mean would you not say in in the whole spread of people were you a bit of the underdog I think so. Oh, absolutely. Oh, Eric was poised to win from the get-go. Right. I think that I just... I think the only thing that he did was he tried to show off more than he needed to to beat me. Yeah. 
And then so what they do... He kept it like slightly more simple. He probably... Yeah. What they do is they'll scrutinize anything on the plate. You know, if you want to do three ingredients, sure, you might get uh, nab sort of for simplicity or oversimplicity. But if you do five things really well and you do them you do them well you, you're going to get really good marks for that he'd do like eight things you know and, and then, then if you just screw like up if you screw up one or two they're even, like you even took slightly, on too much and then yeah then they're too, like yeah. you overcomplicated it which i had seen and the way that i prepared for chopped was i watched a shit ton of chopped like right. so much chopped so you you kind of got the formula into your head a bit pretty much yeah and so i i ended up uh, i ended up doing uh, moving to the dessert round and i that one was a bit of a, I'm not a pastries person. I ended up making a custard. It was a bit problematic, but it worked in the end. And man, I looked like frantic in that, in that round. Uh, but I ended up making uh, like a duck yolk coconut custard uh, with key lime and uh, some Marcona almond streusel and this burnt i called it a burnt relish brittle because it was this like almost burnt sugar which i knew would have some bitterness to it and i was thinking the only way that i can get rid of this acidity and saltiness is a little bit bitterness yeah with a lot of sweetness and so that was that and i ended up uh i ended up uh winning it was crazy that is pretty crazy Okay, so after all of that, you kicked everyone's butt out of there and you won. And so how did that sort of change your career or your life? Or like, what was the, you know, the aftermath of winning Chopped Canada? Well, it made me, oh man, it gave me so much more confidence for sure. Um, At the time, I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to be doing all the time. Like, while I was working as a private chef, I was still struggling um, with that. And it gave me, it certainly lent a lot of credibility to my name, more than probably it should have, because after all, it's funny how people value, you know, these, you know, reality programs, because really, it's a day in a life, like, and do you feel like there anyway. was a lot of luck involved or no? Like, um, I, I mean, I think that you're giving it to, you're like, well, by some alignment of the stars, I mean, like, when you say that to me, I'm like, well, you're an incredibly creative person. So I don't know if it's an alignment. It's maybe you just felt like it was luck, but I don't think that well, you I were also, the best. I try to keep uh, like humble, <laughs> keep humble. Yeah, because because people, certain people, especially people who don't know anything about food, they see it as this really overcomplicated thing and mm. it's super impressive, especially a lot of people, you know. Uh, that have approached me a lot of people in the Estonian community because they were so like not a lot of primetime media references Estonia and so Estonians get very excited when that happens it happens so rarely well you were written up in like an Estonian newspaper (laughs) I was that's where how I watched one of the (laughs) is that too embarrassing oh no 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 it's I mean I think I found it I found the Estonian article and was like well, because it was the only, I think they posted the link and that's how I found the link to watch the show was through this Estonian article. Oh, I, was I believe. Written, so I was written, I mean, I was written about in the like Canadian Estonian news. I was written about in the Estonian, like from Estonia, the news. Somebody had, somebody had mentioned somebody. Uh, to somebody and they kind of took it and ran with it. Yeah. Canadian Estonian, Paul Oh Guess my God. Yeah, 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 yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. And so they wrote about me in this in this in like one of the biggest news outlets in Estonia and uh and then well I got called for an interview and for both for both news outlets and so I did those interviews and then uh, the really funny thing was that I had done this in like May and it didn't air till January 1st so right. I had it's already a long time. But, but I won I got my prize like an, a a month sorry after winning and so it didn't take me that long to spend ten thousand dollars. Like I, I, I paid off a lot of debts. I went on a like a great trip, a European right? like, like hopping yeah. trip, and and that was pretty much most of it. And so when I find, when it finally aired, like this money was history. It was great history. Like I had done a lot with a lot it. of like memories. A lot. Oh a lot yeah, of yeah. Stuff happening. I, I have no regrets. But so about like that. you had the excitement of the winning, the the actual award, and then it's done and basically spent. Like because that's yeah. a very quick. It's go, spent. And, and this fast. person in a, this interviewer, this this journalist is saying, "How so excited how are you? Are you gonna <laughs> use all that money?" And I'm like, like, "Baby, I'm like, it's well, gone." Exactly. I was like, "Well, you know, in Estonia too." I'm like, "Well, I already spent it." You know, uh, and they're like. 
<laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, it was, you know. You didn't invest it with the Estonian it Bank of Canada? No, it, <laughs> yeah. was, it was seven months ago. And then, so, the, I guess the way that the article was written, it didn't really outline that it would, like, what I spent it on. And a few days later, I get a text or an email or something, and it was like, you've been written about in the Estonian tabloids. And I'm like, what? And I, oh, I got a link and like a like a, a normal tabloid, like a tabloid, like a tabloid, tabloid, oh. like like a like a ready like a gossip tabloid. tabloid. Yeah. What? And it, the headline what was, was it? Estonian Canadian chef already spent winnings. That was the headline. Like, what? and there's all these people like commenting, <laughs> like people who are obviously not very well off, being what like, being like, yeah. those Canadian Estonians, they're living in their gold That's houses a, or whatever. A like, completely different <laughs> thing here, man. Yeah. You're like, I paid off school or whatever it ended up being, and I went on a trip. Like, if yeah, yeah, it's but expensive. it certainly gave me a lot. That's of... That's hilarious. I didn't know about the tabloid. <laughs> oh yeah, and it certainly. I mean, it's a hilarious story, but it certainly gave me a lot of. Um, it certainly gave me a, a lot of exposure. Yeah. Like, I got people, I got called a celebrity so much. And it kind of, it's weird <laughs> that that's, having been trying to pursue acting and all that, you know, it's 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 both what I always wanted and sort of, like, the bane of my existence. Because I, yeah, like, I was like, oh, don't call me that. Because yeah. I, I always, I, I guess through all that I figured I'd rather be called a celebrity for something more monumental. Like if I did something I mean, better yeah. or something that I value. I more. think you're really logical in that way that you're looking at it going like I spent like 12 hours doing the actual show. Like you like you said, you went in and you all of a sudden you came out. It was dark and you're sitting in your car with, you know, I've won 10 grand. Very yeah. quick things. It's I think to you, you're probably seeming, you know, like it's a lifetime achievement or, or many years at something or like a big book or like a big thing that makes you the celebrity yeah it just means different different thing i know and but some people and you know a lot of people in the estonian community they want to put their faith in somebody and uh they just i guess they really love bragging about somebody in the community doing something that they're proud of and so i was a super flatter i had still am when people bring it up and people still bring it up and here we are like two years later um Almost exactly. And uh, yeah, so it was crazy. But then after the whole thing was said and done, I was saying to myself, you know, I'm actually, I'm going to try to do this private chef thing full time. Okay, guys, I'm pausing here for a short second. I don't currently have any sponsorship for this podcast, but if I did, this is likely where the shout out to them would go. Faking it promotes a healthy and positive lifestyle. I can see us representing anything from health, alternative lifestyle, travel, and overall personal well-being products. So if you yourself have a small business or work for a big one, or maybe know somebody else who might be interested in placing their ad here, please drop us a message through our email, fakingitpodcast at gmail.com or on our website, www.fakingitpodcast.com under the sponsorship tab. I'd love to hear from you. So I was applying for personal chef jobs, which were known to be more lucrative, more creative, more fresh, you know, less and that's repetitive. Like a, a day-to-day type of thing where you're coming into somebody's house. Yeah, to cook you, each meal. you, or you're traveling with somebody, or whatever. You're on a yacht. There's all sorts of different avenues. So I was applying for them. I was speaking with agencies and so on and so forth, and I would apply through a bunch of different um, channels. And one was always Craigslist, which was, you know, as anyone who's been on Craigslist knows, like, <laughs> sketchy looking, you know, as totally nondescript. Yeah, as you can get. Yeah, it's just a list. And so I find this ad one day, and I'd already been applying to numerous ones, and they're all different. And this one ad said, seeking pers- or private chef, personal chef, Monday to Friday. And I was like, oh Jackpot. my god first time like, in your life yeah. you're gonna actually have weekends off it's the land of milk and honey yeah. so i apply <laughs> for it and i swear the chop canada thing is what like got me the call back i i'm like i'm 99.9 percent sure right but it did and i got a call back and i got i got asked to come in and do a dinner not uh I, well i got asked to call come and do a dinner and it was like on easter weekend so this is like a few months later and uh so i waited and i did the dinner i went there and it was for a woman named nancy zimmerman and and i said okay i know what's going on this is an old jewish couple rich surely so that's that's what this is sure whatever okay so i go there 
And I go to Nancy's house, and she's an artist, so her walls are covered with this extraordinary work, like this really amazing uh, artwork. And, you know, she's very, you know, well-spoken, and but and maybe around in her 50s. And then she takes me to her kitchen, and there's two people like my age sitting there, and I'm like, oh, hi there. And she says, well, these are my kids. You're going to be cooking for them tonight. She had said, you're going to be cooking for two. I just assumed I'd be cooking for her and husband. So they're very down to earth and um, cool. And I cooking for them and talking to them. And they're asking me about, well, chop and all this other stuff. And then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the in to be like, what does your dad do? What does your dad do? So finally, I was just like, so what does your dad do anyway? And they're like, oh, our, our dad. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. And they're so like, who's your dad? Yeah. And they're, and they're like, <laughs> oh. And I guess like <laughs> put it together. Kind of put it together. Like, this guy has no idea who he's cooking. Yeah, for. she's like, oh, oh, the oh the client's not our dad. He's our brother. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And there was sort of this like awkward pause. And then I guess I later found out they weren't supposed to say who it was on that first interview, but they, it was this or interview audition, stash, whatever you want to call it. And but there was this point of mutual understanding where it was like. Are you going to tell me what the hell's going on? This is too mysterious for a job interview. Did you just want a free meal or was that? Yeah. <laughs> and so she said, oh, our brother is the DJ Dead Mouse," And <laughs> I knew who Dead Mouse was not through being a huge fan. I think I had one or two of his songs on my iPod, but my very, friends yeah, spe- were. Yeah, into it. Yeah, a very specific genre of music. Yeah, yeah so. like very big in the EDM world and certainly the most famous EDM artist at the time in Canada. Oh, for sure. I and mean, so still. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. And so so I recognized him and my stomach dropped because I was kind of... You weren't of, prepared for, like, celebrity. No, in terms of and I was thinking that's what I wanted, like, maybe years down the line, you know? Like, I remember hearing about, like, Art Smith, who was Oprah's personal chef and then went on to have this great restaurant and he had been on Top Chef and all this stuff. And uh, but now you're like, oh, a nice, quaint Jewish couple. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> now, the enough. whole thing is turned upside down. Yeah. Uh, and I was just like, I need to get this. I need, oh, and I was also thinking, when I get home and tell my friends about this, they are going to lose their shit. So I wanted it. The dinner was going really well. And then I found that out. I tried to stay cool and just be like, oh, okay. Like, I tried to play like I didn't know who he was. Who's that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I never heard of him. Dead, but, who, uh, dead who? <laughs> dead who? <laughs> what mouse? Dead Mouth 5, which yeah. I later heard a zillion in one time. Of so course. I... So I finished the dinner for them. They liked it, and uh, and then at the end of it, they said, "Okay, we want you to cook. We want you to cook for Joel." And that was they, nobody called him Dead Mouse. They called him Joel. His name's Joel. <laughs> the family. Yeah, Dead Mouse. Your chef is here. <laughs> it turns out these were his siblings. So this was his brother's sister and his mom's Nancy. Right. So and, they're just doing the pre-interview, so no one sort of right. Well, he like actually that. he wasn't in the country. He was somewhere doing a show. I don't even know where. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not even sure. It wasn't even in the summer. He plays a lot in Vegas and Ibiza and stuff like that. So they said, we want you to cook for him. He's back in a week or something like that. So it was Easter weekend. So I went off. I did my own thing. And then that's, again, kind of like the child thing. Another when the nerves begin. Another week to worry about stuff. Right. And I was looking for work at the time. And so a week is another long length of time to wait. And uh, anyway, the week passed. I went there. And he is... Uh, I was warned actually by Nancy, you know, he doesn't, um, he doesn't talk a whole lot. Like he does his own thing. He, you know, sort of comes and goes. He spends a lot of time in the studio. Like he's not, and Nancy even said to me, she's like, he's not like me. He's not chatty, you know, so just don't expect that, you know? Um, so I went and sure enough, you know, yeah, he's not, he's a man of few words. And, uh, for a really social person like me, it's hard to gauge the situation with somebody like that. Uh, so I had to just sort of do my absolute best, make the best food that I could. And then, you know, if I didn't get it, then I didn't get it, but I did my best. And so I made, oh, and I was told that he liked sushi. So I made a tuna tataki. And this is the first thing I think I made for him. I made tuna tataki. So like the seared tuna wrapped in sesame seeds, seared, and then um, sliced real thin uh, with panko fried avocado in between so like Mm. hot crispy avocado and then soy maple reduction and something else i don't even remember sort of like this really really nice app plate and he was eating it (laughs) 
off sort of in another part of this nice penthouse. Like, so it was open concept, but he was quite a ways away and he's eating it. And I'm, I'm sort of like stiff, like really freaked out. And all I heard was, fuck, that's good. Like so loudly. And I was like, <laughs> like it scared me, but then I'm like, Oh, that's good. Like, <laughs> I didn't say that, but it was like just me and him. Like I'm standing there, he's over there, he's eating, not looking at me. He's not talking to you. No, and I was just like cleaning up and working on the next one. And then, so (laughs) the meal went well. I guess. And then I spent the next 10 months being his personal chef until he moved away. Awesome. Uh, Yeah, I had to do like a two week probation sort of period where I wasn't told whether I was the official chef. Because they didn't want to make sure you're not a complete freak. Right. Also, sometimes I had to get like the keys and let myself in and do all those things. So I got to trust you for sure. Right. Did you like that experience being a personal chef? Oh my God, it was amazing. It wasn't my, like every job that I've ever had, I've liked for different reasons. That one, the hours were great. Best summer ever. You know, I had a lot of free time. It was very, not flexible, but very easy to do i got to be very creative i had way more free time than i have now uh like he was in the city i was in the city um and so yeah it worked at that time as it worked really well at that time and then people ask me why i stopped it's because he moved quite a ways away um he bought a house and it was just not realistic for me without moving there which i wouldn't have done to continue and i was ready for something else anyway um you know spending 10 months, 10 and a bit, almost a year uh, of writing we- uh, like daily menus and having them change every single day. Like it was great. I loved it. Uh, but Great exercises yeah, and moving for your brain. And- exactly. But I was ready. I was ready for something else. So, and I wanted to get back to the media side of things that I oh, was yeah. basically going for as well. Initially, or yeah. Trying to bring my, you know, my comedy, my communications, my food and everything together. Right. Uh, and this was more like being a luxury servant. Yeah. So while it was great sometimes and it had great perks, sometimes I'd be like, boy, I am literally living to feed this, this one man. You're you right. Know? So, yeah. That's how mothers feel. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that kind of brings me to my, my next question here about, uh, firstly, the balance of creativity and your and your business side of things. So how do you find, do you find it easy to balance creative projects as well with like, is that super separate for you? Or is it like, I go to work at the, at an office or I go to work at, you know, this place. And then later I have this very clear allotted time for like my creative projects. Or do they kind of just cross over and meld for you? Oh God, no, there's never enough time to do any of it. <laughs> like, as you know, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult. You want to do more. I wish there were two of me so I could pursue all the creative projects that I want to pursue. But um, yeah, I, I basically just try to get as much done on my spare time as possible and currently I'm commuting a lot for work so there's not that much time but you just do your best I guess and then try to connect with the people who can help you with that and try to connect and align your schedules and it's very difficult but ultimately something gets done in the end and yeah, so so you were just saying at the end there too, you were kind of ready to move on, not as much as like, if he'd probably stayed in Toronto, I'm sure you would have done it for a little bit longer, but mm-hmm. it's felt like a, a time to, you know, meld a couple of different things together. So yeah. in that in that way, um, we've worked, collaborated on a project together as well. So Food Styles, you want to just talk a little bit about that, where people can find it and everything? Yeah, uh, so Food Styles is a cooking and sketch comedy show. I always wanted to do a cooking show, and um, I didn't want to... Well, having spoken to a lot of people that had done cooking shows for networks and other things, uh, I knew the only way that I'd be able to do sort of what I wanted was to collaborate with people and sort of take the reins and do it our own way, uh, not be at the mercy of any, let's say, non-creative like business folk. Uh, and so, yeah, we collaborated to create this. It's uh, We made a pilot. It's a three-segment, three-cooking segment, uh, cooking show featuring sort of what not to do sketches that are attached with each dish that I make. And moving forward, uh, we're going to make more of them just shorter, sort of uh, not for TV, but for the web. And you can find it on YouTube at Food Styles Sketch Comedy and Cooking Show. Actually, I think it's Food Styles Cooking and Sketch Comedy Show Um, or on Twitter and Instagram as well. With food styles. Food styles. With Chef Paul. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. So what are your current goals right now? Because you're kind of in this period where you're, you know, commuting for, for work. That's a food related sort of job. Mm-hmm. And then you have food styles and you have, you know, you still like to do all of the, the different private cooking events and everything. So what are your like overall arching goals? Um, and how do you want to achieve those? I'd like for my main goal, I'd like to get into doing more media events um media in what way though well media in i'd like to do more public appearance whether that's online on youtube through food styles through another like I, i've taught cooking classes i've i've done you some did of one that to the stuff. lcbo recently. i worked through the lcbo i've done cooking classes at uh loblaws cooking school um i've done demonstrations at various places and but i what I'd like to, what I, I ultimately I'd like to do is I'd like to make food styles, um, more of a reality. I'd like, I'd like for, I'd like to find a way to disseminate it well. It's really new. We just launched it, uh, about three weeks ago. And so uh, we, I just want to create more of that and start to sort of make a name for myself online because I think that's the place to be. And I think that YouTube is the place to do it. And there's not a whole lot of cooking comedy combinations on YouTube at all. Certainly not many that are real cooking. Anything that has been real cooking is just sort of real cooking. Anything that's cooking and comedy tends to be more gag cooking. You know, whether that's really over the top food or gross food or, you know, somebody who's never made food making food and it looks so terrible that it's funny. I think. There are people out there and millennials in general who love comedy and they love to cook and they'd like to do, I, I know that they enjoy both. And so I feel like to, to, to diversify, to differentiate what we're doing, our show from all the other cooking shows is to offer both. And it's, it, it'll be figuring out exactly how to do that, finding the right formula for creating that, which is, as I see it, the next step. I want to know what your favorite dish is that you like to cook. Probably that tuna tataki. The fuck that's good tataki. <laughs> You'll rename that one. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I love a Caesar salad. That's always been, that's been my favorite dish since I was like five years old. It Important question, is. creamy or vinegary? dressing i think there's a time and a place for both i think Good answer. there's a there's a january first caesar salad and then there's a like there's like a labor day weekend caesar oh, salad. i see i see and i love them both and i i i use it interchangeably as well as all sorts of other variations on it i think um i've thought i've I sort of romanticized about having a an all caesar salad restaurant where you have like 15 different types and they're so different but they're all sort of bound together by this one classic dish Mm -hmm. which is so iconic and arguably like the most common dish if you that if you don't consider like fries to be a dish you know or you know pepperoni pizza well that's a dish but i mean you know what i mean like on so many different restaurants menus present yeah in so many different countries all over the world so I love it. I just, I gotta say, I love that. And I'm gonna be doing a variation on it for the dinner for you after this. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And I did wanna say, I have eaten Paul's food before, been a part of the Food Styles cooking show, so I know his brilliance. You guys really should consider hiring him for whatever you need him to do. So, personal stuff, events, whatever. All your animals. And yeah. <laughs> and in that, um, how do people find you in order to do those kinds of things to book you? Uh, people can find me through my website, it's paullilicus.com. Um, my contact info is there as well as the pilot for the food style food styles cooking show as well as my portfolio of food photography and the recipes from that first pilot uh, with that I want to also share my memory of Paul disappearing while I was waiting out in his backyard for him um, uh, Paul what? was <laughs> So we were all hanging out. This goes back to earlier in the show when we were talking about Paul disappearing to create very amazing dishes. Um, and I was hanging out in the backyard with Paul one day. And Whose backyard? Um, your, your backyard. Your mom's My backyard. My mom's backyard. They're like the side patio backyard. We're like maybe 17. Maybe. That's how old we were. Okay. And uh, Paul's, you know, entertaining, being the, the great entertainer that he is, great host, and is just like, wait a minute, guys, I'll be right back. He disappears for probably a half an hour. And we're just like, where the hell's Paul, man? Like, we're just... 
<laughs> hanging out or whatever. And like we're 17. This is like, let's go out to get pizza or let's go out to do something. Like no one cooked. I didn't create anything. Paul just comes blasting into the backyard with the most beautiful array of like um, deviled eggs that I've ever seen. And I'm oh my like, God. He's like, you know, I, I, I just had to do something with them. I didn't know what to do. I just got inspired, guys. And we're just like, okay, Paul, we ate them. It was oh, yeah, weird, but it was amazing and delicious. And he's uh, come a long way from the random devil. <laughs> I don't make those anymore. <laughs> uh, in, any, in any case, um, I, thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. And um, you inspire me, and I, I hope you continue to do what you're doing because you're really good at it. Thank you. You too. Keep faking it, people. We'll talk to you later. Bye, Paul. Bye. A big thanks to Paul for coming on and sharing with us his experiences in faking it in being a badass winner and especially and personally for being someone who challenges and supports the personal journey I'm on. Oh, and for also cooking the most delicious three course meal I've ever had. Really, you all should be very jealous. Book Paul for your next event. You will not regret doing so. The next episode will release in two weeks time on February 10th. Remember to subscribe and comment on iTunes and SoundCloud and follow us through our Facebook group and on Twitter at Faking It Podcast.